Good morning to you, and as always, a very warm welcome to you, one and all, to our worship of God here at Gilcombe St. Church. I know some of you are visiting, some of you here for the first time, and uh, whoever you are, we're just delighted to extend in Christ's name a very warm welcome to you. Uh, we love having you here, and are glad that you're able to share with us in our worship of God this morning. And the same applies to those of you who are joining us online. Uh, we're always very conscious that uh, for many of you, it's the, the kind of lifeline that you have, uh, the one opportunity you have to be involved with us here in this way. We're glad to welcome you as well, and do pray that the Lord would minister uh, his grace to you according to your needs today. So welcome to you as well. Um, you'll be aware, um, some of you, that uh, over the, uh, these weeks we, we're thinking about being rooted in uh, this particular congregation, what that means, what matters, and so on. And we hold uh, next Sunday afternoon uh, an afternoon where there's the opportunity really just to ask you questions, find out more about what it means, uh, why it matters, and so on. Uh, that's at four o'clock next Sunday afternoon. There are sign-up sheets that would help us uh, if you could just put down a note of your name, um, and that gives us an idea how many we um, will be catering for, as it were. That's next Sunday afternoon at uh, four o'clock, and the sign-up sheet's there on a... Um, uh, blue folder up at the welcome desk at the back there, so uh, do fill one of them in. That's next Sunday afternoon. Psalmist uh, says this, we were reading this uh, uh, psalm last night at the prayer meeting, and uh, it rounds off in these ways, the salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. And we join together then to worship God and take up uh, words penned a long time ago uh, that point forward to a day yet to come when the nations as a whole uh, recognize that he is indeed our stronghold and our refuge. Behold, the mountain of the Lord in latter days shall rise. Let us worship God.
Well, let's bow now together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Almighty God, it's uh, good to be here, good to gather together, good to be able to unite our voices and to sound out the praise of our hearts and to rejoice in that prospect and that promise that you've given to us that the day will come when those from all over the world, different nations, different tribes, different tongues shall gather together, a vast, vast multitude, gather together before your throne to rejoice in all that you are, to rejoice in all that you've done, and all that you've secured for us in the person of your Son, our risen Lord Jesus Christ. You are our refuge. You are our stronghold. You are our deliverer. You are our Savior. You're the God who rescues us. You're the God who hears us in our cries, who sees us in our need. You're the God who has come to us uh, wonderfully in Jesus Christ, your Son, and done for us all that is needed to secure our lasting welfare, and you extend that to us so freely that sometimes we find it hard to believe it could be possible. Uh, you lavish your kindness upon us. You demonstrate your mercy towards us. And all the while, uh, reveal yourself to be the altogether righteous God. We love you, Lord. We delight in you. We're glad to gather with one another and together to bring to you our praise as we bring that worship to you. And we seek, living God, that help of your Holy Spirit, that, that he would illumine our minds, that he would uh, stir within our hearts that sense of wonder and delight and gratitude as he opens our eyes to behold the greatness and the glory of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he has come. Thank you that he has done for us as one of us what we could never do ourselves. He's lived that life of matchless obedience and righteousness. He stood in our place and died in our place and born the God forsakenness that was our due in order that we might ourselves now in him find a complete forgiveness. What a wonderful reality that is, our God, because all of us, we come here before you this morning, we're conscious of a multitude of different ways in which we have uh, got things wrong. We've just blown it again and again in terms of what we've said, in terms of what we've done, the attitudes that we've adopted, the choices that we've made, the way we've engaged with people, and sometimes the way we've studiously avoided engaging with people. And we know that our first need, our deepest need, is for your forgiveness. And so we come before you to worship you in the name of your Son, because in him you declare there is that complete forgiveness. You wipe the slate clean, you give us a new start, you put us on our feet, and you empower us by your Holy Spirit to live lives to your praise and glory. Would you come by your Spirit, living God, and meet with us in such a manner that we should know that you are indeed very present with us, that your eye is upon us, your heart is towards us, and we pray that you would speak into our lives this day in a way that will be life-changing and to your praise and glory. Grant us then your help and your blessing in our worship this day, that it may be pleasing to you, that it may be in all regards honoring to you as well. And we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Great. We're going to read the scripture, um, and we're in Ephesians chapter 3 today. Richard is going to come and read the passage for us from Ephesians chapter 3, and uh, we'll have the words on the screen for you as well. Yes, we're in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, just a few verses at the beginning of uh, chapter 3, starting at verse 2, uh, writes the Apostle Paul, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, 
the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Amen. Great. Thank you, Richard. Um, wonder, do, you, do you want to bring the, the, the next slide up uh, on the screen? There we go. Um, that is, you know what that is? Who can tell me what that is? Yep. It is a jigsaw piece, and I brought a jigsaw piece with me here today, tiny little jigsaw piece, and uh, it is from one of the many jigsaws that we have upstairs in the office, not because we spend our time working away at jigsaws, they just happen to get stored there. And I'd like to guess how many pieces are in this jigsaw. I I'm going to have to remember to which, which box I have to put it back into, otherwise someone is going to really... How, how many do you think, Hannah? 2,000, yeah, um, is a good guess. What do you think? 5,000, what do you think? Oh, 500, 500, okay. Uh, what are you going to say? You're going to say 2,000. It's a 1,000 piece bit. If you looked at that, you'd think, well, that's a pretty boring bit of cardboard. It doesn't really have anything uh, really to say to anyone. It's just one piece in what is actually a 1,000 piece jigsaw. Um, and uh, I'll not tell you what the jigsaw is of. You can go and find out later on. It's up there in the, the office there, and we, we hold them there. One little bit out of a thousand doesn't give you any idea of the picture at all. The piece that I've got on the screen there is from a big, big jigsaw. Any like to guess what the picture is of, what the jigsaw is of when you see it like that? You haven't really much of a clue. What do you think? A snowy day, that's a pretty good guess that because it looks just a little bit like a snowy day. You're absolutely right. And uh, if you were to look at the big picture, it's uh, something like that. What do you think, Sam? Stars. stars, it could be stars as well like that. Uh, I'll show you what it's a big picture of. It is what used to be the biggest uh, jigsaw in the world, the biggest commercially sold jigsaw in the world. We'll put it on the screen for you. There we go. Anyone like to guess how many pieces that jigsaw has? How many pieces does that have? It is, I'll give you a clue, it is about uh, six feet in, uh, in height, and who knows how many feet long, like that. I mean, it's a big, big jigsaw. Any ideas? How many do you think it is? 10,000 is a pretty good guess, but it's way off the mark. It is, what do you think, Hannah? 5,000, again, it's, it's a good guess. It is nothing like that, yep. Uh, it's not as big as one million, but you're, you're close. It is 40,000 pieces, 40,230 or something like that. We'll put there, yeah, 320 pieces, right? It is big, right? And you would, you would be really, really annoyed if when you got to the end of it, there was one bit missing. It's like, oh, wow, you know, I've put in 40,319 bits, and where's the last bit, please? Uh, it is a big, big, big jigsaw. Right, and you can see on the picture there on the right of the screen uh, just how big it is with some of the people who've been building it up and they're kind of throwing bits of jigsaw in the air like that. Uh, 40,320 bits for that jigsaw and eventually you get the picture like that. It is not the biggest jigsaw in the world uh, because back in October of last year, October, November, you were able to buy from Costco an even bigger jigsaw, we'll put the bigger jigsaw up on the screen for you now. That's what it looks like, the uh, even bigger jigsaw that uh, Costco was, I shouldn't advertise Costco, but I've already said their name about five times, so um, we're done for now. Um, but yeah, in that particular um, shop, you could buy uh, a jigsaw that looked like that. Anyone like to guess how many bits that has? And it's not a million, Susanna, by the way. Uh, anyone like, it's, it's less than a million, yep. 50,000 is close, uh, but it's actually, I think, 60,000 bits in that one, okay? Uh, 60,000 pieces, and uh, you put every single bit together, 60,000 pieces, that's an awful lot of pieces. Uh, you eventually get the whole picture, and you think, wow, that's a pretty impressive picture there of uh, all sorts of different places in the world. Even that is not the biggest jigsaw in the world. The biggest jigsaw in the world was put together, uh, you can't buy this one in the shops, by the way, um, but it was put together back in 2011, and uh, uh, there you can see it is massive, absolutely massive, and it took 1,600 students, who don't have anything better to do with their time, presumably, uh, to put the jigsaw together like that out in Vietnam. Anyone like to guess how many bits that one has? How many do you think? 
100,000, right? We are really going up the way now from 40,000 up to 60,000, up to 100,000. Um, uh, but it's not 100,000, no. Uh, it is, it is 551,000. We'll put up the, the numbers there for you. 551,232 pieces. Exactly. Okay, that's an awful lot of pieces, and it is huge. You can see just how large an area it covers, and, and all these individual bits of the jigsaw, you put them all together, and gradually you build up the picture, and you see what it's a picture of like that. And it's something like that that Paul is on about when he's writing to the church at Ephesus here, the bit that Richard read. Uh, he, he wasn't talking about jigsaws, obviously, but it was that sort of thing that uh, he's, he's trying to help them understand that, that every individual believer is part of a much, much bigger picture that God is wanting to show to the world. And when you begin to put them all together, when you join them together as part of a church family like that, you begin to get the idea of what God is about. And so um, the biggest jigsaw of all, if we can call it that, is, uh, is this one that we'll put up on the screen for you now. And it's not a jigsaw you can buy in the shop at all. It's a jigsaw that is made up by God of different people from all sorts of different places, all sorts of different countries, all sorts of different nationalities and languages and backgrounds. And, and God is bringing them all together as part of his big, big, big family in Jesus Christ in order that in their common life and the way that they live with one another, the way they share with one another, the way they worship with one another, the way they, they serve with one another, uh, that the world may begin to get an idea of just uh, who God is, what God is like. And it's his way of showing the world that God is great. And we'll put that up on the screen for you as well. That as we will learn to live out with one another, our life together in Jesus as followers of Jesus, he's able to show the world how great he is. And uh, the last verse that, uh, um, well, he, he, Richard read this verse, the mystery is the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together in one body, shares together in promise in Christ Jesus. And a little bit later in the passage, uh, he goes on to say that God's intent was that now through the church, all these different people, all these different believers, some old, some young, some tall, some small, all sorts of different shapes, sizes, and backgrounds, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. In other words, it's in and through his church that God means to show uh, what an amazing God he is, that God is wonderfully great. And, and that's what he's writing to the Ephesians about, saying it's, it's a big privilege that you have, a, a huge responsibility and privilege that in your life together, when you live out your life as uh, fellow believers, um, together you're able to show the world how great and good God is. So before you head off to Sunday school, I thought we would sing a, a song that was written by a guy that some of us know, uh, Crawford McKenzie, I think is uh, the author of this song. Uh, Jesus wants me to be a bright light shining. He wants us together to be able to show the world how wonderful, great, and glorious God is. Jesus wants me to be a bright light shining.
right, time now for Sunday School. You're going to enjoy yourselves. Look forward to seeing you at the end of our worship here this morning. Have a good time and learn well. And I'm madly trying to find where that bit of jigsaw is going. That'd be dreadful, wouldn't it? A thousand piece jigsaw and uh, you can't find the last bit. It's so infuriating when that happens. And uh, that just underlines for us that uh, every single believer matters. And if, if one is missing from the, uh, the jigsaw that is God's church, then uh, yeah, it's a kind of glaring gap that there is. So uh, we each do matter. That's really very much what we are, are thinking about through these weeks, um, the first six weeks, uh, taking a chapter at a time in the letter that Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. And there is that booklet that we have at the back that's available for you um, uh, called Simply Sing a New Song. And it uses the 15 psalms in the Psalter that are often referred to as the songs of ascent there, songs, psalms that were sung by the people of God as they traveled together, gathered together in Jerusalem. And uh, uh, it uh, uses that as the, the kind of framework for working through what membership of Christ's church involves. Come back to that uh, in a moment or two when we turn to the, the scripture, but let's join now together in prayer. Good our Father, as we uh, come before yourself, we're often really very aware of how insignificant each of us is in the grand scheme of things. When we read of all that's going on in the world, we, we wonder what difference a single individual like ourselves could possibly make. And we, we do very much feel just like a, a little bit of a jigsaw, tiny little bit of a massive, massive jigsaw. And we marvel that nonetheless you are pleased to pick us up and to shape us by your Holy Spirit and to, to fit us into all that you are doing in the world in such a manner that as we join with our fellow believers and begin to discover those bonds that unite us, the one to the other, that uh, together we're able to, to illustrate to a hungry world just the degree to which Jesus is the very bread of life, able to demonstrate to a dark world that the light has shone, and what a, a lovely brightness there is to the light of your glory shining out in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it, it certainly is our desire, living God, that, that our lives should be lived in that manner, that even if it is just to be one tiny little pixel in the portrait that you paint for the world of the beauty of your Son, the risen Lord Jesus, then uh, count us in, living God. We, we want to be part of that. We want to know that down through the ages of eternity, our lives have that sort of significance that they're used by yourself to portray the glory of your Son. And so we thank you for your every mercy towards us. Thank you for that grace whereby you lay hold of our lives, no matter who we are, no matter what our background is, no matter what baggage we bring with us. You're, you're glad to welcome us in and for the sake of your Son the Lord Jesus Christ, to be a part of your people, to be a part of your family, and to share with you as the, the means by which your Holy Spirit continues to work in the world today. Thank you for your faithfulness to all your promises. It's wonderful for us, Father, to read in the Scripture the, the lavish promises that you have made, the promise that you will always be with your people, that your eye is always upon your people, that you know our every circumstance and our every need, you anticipate our every problem and difficulty, and that you have undertaken to protect us, to provide for us, to lead and direct us, and to bring us safely to our desired haven, even to your own home, that we may dwell with you forever. 
Thank you, living God, that you declare yourself to be the God who daily bears our burdens, who comes alongside us to, to take the load from us and to carry that load and to sustain us through all the ups and downs of this earthly life. And some of us, as we, we bow before you, living God, some of us are just going through the mill at the moment, just tough, tough times, dark times, difficult times, Weary sometimes where we, we really wonder, are we going to make it? Uh, sometimes we, we just don't see any light at the end of the tunnel at all. And everything just crowds in upon us, becomes quite overwhelming. Some of us struggling, living God, with uh, a lot of pain, uh, physical pain, uh, sometimes emotional pain and uh, mental pain. As... Uh, our heads, it seems sometimes, just about to explode with all that is going on. Some of us struggling with financial issues and worried and anxious about what the future is going to hold and, and getting into a spiral of debt and how on earth are we going to get out of that and where is it going to take us and suck us down to. Some of us just with hearts that are broken, uh, with uh, sorrow and loss through bereavement, through disappointment, through hurt. And it just sometimes has felt the, the stabbing pain of sorrow and grief. And thank you, Father, that you, you know each of us. You have your eye upon us. And your desire is indeed to wrap those everlasting arms around us and beneath us to sustain us and to carry us and to see us through all our present circumstances and to bring us to a better place. Thank you for that promise and thank you that it's, it's not an empty promise at all, that it's rooted not only in uh, the uh, faithfulness that is yours, that integrity whereby you never flag up something that you, you don't mean to and aren't able to, to bring to fruition, but it's rooted also in what you've already demonstrated yourself to be able of doing. Thank you that you, you have raised your son Jesus from death, that he was dead, buried, absolutely, and yet you raised him back to life and commend him to us as the one who is alive and the one in whom that victory, even over death, is now guaranteed, you declare to your people, that we too shall be raised and shall be raised to eternal life and will enter into a whole new world, a new heaven, a new earth with a new body, at last able to enjoy you to the full, to serve you to the full, and to be with you in glory for eternity. Thank you for that rich promise. And yet we were very conscious, living God, that um, whatever the future may hold, the present is, is a, a tough call in so many regards. We hear what is going on in the Ukraine, Father, and it must be devastating, desolating, terrible, for all those who are caught up in that, those whose homes and whose cities are bombarded with bombs and destroyed, those who find themselves um, unwillingly often just involved in conflict, involved in fighting, and with all the trauma of that, with all the terror of that, with all the, the sorrow and the pain of that, and how they would wish to be out of it as well. How we long, Lord, that you would bring about a peace in that conflict, and we cry out to you with countless others and ask, please, living God, you are the judge of all the earth. You're the God who, who takes to do with the world in which we live. We ask that you would, with all righteousness, address that scenario and bring to an end that conflict. Have mercy, we pray. And not the only arena of conflict in the world by any means. We're, we're very conscious of that. And so we pray that wherever there is that conflict, you would help those who seek to, uh, to bring about and negotiate peace. 
We pray, Lord God, for those areas of the world where there is huge, huge deprivation, where there's famine, where there's drought, where there's been uh, the devastation occasioned by floods and by typhoons and by all manner of disasters, when everything has just got swept away and where there's nothing really to be able to look forward to, not even a next meal. Lord God, we pray for relief agencies as they seek to rebuild broken and devastated communities. Help them, we pray, and be their enabling. We pray, Lord God, for those set in authority over us in our own lands to govern us and to rule us both locally and nationally. When the issues that they have to address are complicated issues, but issues that need to be resolved, and we pray, Lord, please, that you would grant them wisdom, integrity, compassion, and righteousness in so addressing them and in so dealing with them. We pray, Lord God, that here in our own city, as the council seeks to regenerate the center of town after the impact of the pandemic and the restrictions that there were with the way that so much uh, within the, the center of town has been uh, left uh, desolate, we pray, Lord God, that you would give them wisdom as they seek to address these things in consultation with others. And on a wider front in this whole area, the City Council, the Aberdeenshire Council, as they get to grips with a lot of the issues that there are, help them, Lord, we pray. And grant that we may be able as individuals and as a fellowship and as part of your church in this city, help us to see how we too are able to play our part. Thank you that we're able uh, through the week to open our doors on a Wednesday to provide warm places for people to come. Thank you that there's the opportunity to meet with folk, to share with folk, to feed folk. We pray that you would give to us that perspective that enables us to recognize opportunities that there are to commend the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in very practical ways to the needs within our city in these days. Be with those, Father, who are ill. Remember them before you. Be with those who are confined now to their own homes, some and in nursing homes, care homes, others. Those who are in hospital and those who work in the hospital and in the medical profession, subject as it is to such huge strains. Those who are involved in education with all the huge demands that there are and the huge responsibilities laid on their shoulders. Those who've been bereaved, we commend them to you, Father, and pray that you would comfort them in their sorrow. And we pray that in our life together as a family of your people, we may indeed know your hand upon us, shaping us, and infusing through our life together that pulsing grace of the risen Jesus present among us in all the fullness of his majesty, in all the fullness of his love and his care, in such a manner that all who come to share in our life will indeed encounter Jesus himself. Hear us then, gracious God, we pray in these our prayers and in all the unspoken prayers of our hearts as we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, before we turn in a moment or two to the, the Word of God, uh, let's join to sing again 
uh, really a prayer as we come to the Word of God. Uh, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Just asking that God, who, who does know us, He would just uh, manifest His Word into our hearts and lives today. We say a, a very ready amen to that, that the Lord would indeed um, fill my poor heart with thy great love divine, and that he would find our hearts uh, really very open to his word. We're in Ephesians 3, and uh, really the backdrop to this is the concern that we have to underline uh, just how important it is that you and I, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, are rooted in a fellowship of God's people. Uh, the Bible simply does not know, does not recognize an individual isolated follower of Christ. Um, that, is, that is just something that does not exist in the Scriptures. You cannot be, so far as the scriptures are concerned, you cannot be a follower of Jesus without being clearly, publicly, and uh, faithfully a member of his church, rooted in a fellowship. And, and we're keen, therefore, to, to help you put down roots in our life as a church here. And through uh, these six weeks, really hoping to, to work through this letter that Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, which is, is commonly understood as the kind of classic book of the Bible that, that teaches about the church. Uh, look through that through these six weeks and, and really try and help you uh, get to grips with three important questions. Put them on the screen for you here. Number one, why? Uh, why is it so important to put down roots in a fellowship of God's people so that you're not just kind of passing through, not just on the periphery of things, but you are committed, you are involved, and you are um, just rooted in that church. 
That's what we, we want to encourage. Uh, if this is the church for you, that's great. We want to encourage you to see that. Put down those roots and uh, do so in such a way that, yeah, it, it'll take more than a hurricane to remove you from uh, our life as a fellowship. Why uh, is it important to put down those good roots? Then secondly, what does that mean to put down good roots? Um, what does it entail in terms of our life as a believer, as part of a fellowship, what's involved in that? And it's largely with that in mind that we uh, produce this booklet uh, called Sing a New Song that I mentioned earlier. Um, it really just under 15 headings uh, seeks to help you navigate your way through the, uh, the life of this congregation, uh, all the intricacies of how it functions and and really what, what the expectations are of those who are um, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and put down roots there in the congregation. Um, you'll find all that in the booklet. And we hope that that's of help to you. And the third question is, is simply, how? How do, I, how do I go about putting down those roots? Uh, how do I become a member? How do I join? How do I tie myself into the life of this congregation? And we'll hope to, to cover that, um, not least on uh, Sunday afternoon coming, if you are able to uh, come along on Sunday afternoon at four o'clock next Sunday afternoon. Uh, we will um, uh, treat you some to refreshment, but also uh, just try and work through with you the sort of questions that you have rather than uh, just having a, a kind of long presentation or anything from the front. It's much more to hear from you uh, with the encouragement to you to yeah, find out what's involved and to be putting down those roots. And then subsequently, obviously, March the 12th, an opportunity for us uh, formally to uh, commit ourselves in that way to the life of this church. Now, Ephesians uh, chapters 1 to 3 really are preoccupied with the first of those questions. Why? And, and it is the first question. Um, it is the most important question in some ways. Why is it so important that as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are involved in, clearly involved in, committed to a fellowship of his people? And the, the first three chapters of Ephesians really um, provide an answer to that. And they, they present three basic reasons why it is so important. Um, and, and they are uh, along these lines. Number one, in terms of um, Ephesians chapter one, uh, it is because the church is the people on whom God concentrates his efforts. Now, he's a, he's a mighty God, and he's, he's got a load of resources and uh, has loads of plans, but they are all concentrated on the church. So when you, you ask, what is it that the risen Jesus is doing in the world today, and there's a multitude of different things that you might think he should be doing, his answer is, you know what I'm doing? I'm building my church. That's what I'm doing. I uh, will build my church. Uh, that's where he concentrates his labors. That's what he's doing. It's not that he kind of ignores everything else, but that's where his labors, his efforts, his resources are concentrated. That's what he's doing, building the church. You want to be a part of what he's doing? You want to be um, a center stage, as it were, in terms of, of the outworking of the purpose of God? Well, the church is where it happens. It doesn't always look like that. It maybe doesn't feel like that, but hey, tough. That's where it happens. Um, it is a messy business, um, and if you've been involved in uh, the construction industry uh, out on a building site, um, sometimes it doesn't actually look like a big cathedral is being built. It, it looks like it is just dust and rubble and a whole load of mess, and you think, really? Do I, do I want to spend my life on a building site like that? And, uh, and yet, that's, that's what's happening. Something massive is going up, and that's chapter one. Chapter 2 that we looked at last week spells out that the church um, is the people among whom God promises his presence. Uh, where two or three are gathered, uh, says Jesus in, in Matthew chapter uh, 18. And that's in a, a very formal context. It's not just kind of randomly, uh, you know, two or, two or three believers happen to, to kind of bump into one another in a cafe. It is in a very formal context that he's talking about, a very structured context, where they are gathered. It doesn't matter how big that fellowship is. Uh, it doesn't matter how small it is. But where they are thus gathered together in that sort of structured way, 
that's where I am. That's where you'll find me, he says. Uh, you want to meet up with me? That's where I can be found. And the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, starts in chapter 1 with this uh, astonishing picture of the, uh, what are called the seven lampstands that are spoken of as the seven churches. And uh, Jesus, where is Jesus? He's right in the midst of them. That's where you find him, in and among his church. That's where he's promised his presence. It's not that you won't find him elsewhere, but that's where he's guaranteed his presence will be found. Anointed. You want to meet with Jesus, you want to encounter Jesus, you want to know his presence, then church is where you come. So chapter one, the purpose of God centers on the church. Chapter two, the presence of uh, the Lord is found there. Chapter three is essentially, uh, as we'll see in a moment or two, this, that the church is the people through whom God reveals his glory. Now, um, you may think that's, that's a big ask, because you think, really? Is um, God going to reveal his glory through this motley collection of individuals? I'm not looking at you and calling you a motley collection, but you know, I am in a sense, because that's all we are in, um, in ourselves. We are a pretty motley collection, uh, a ragtag collection of individuals uh, who are basically, as this booklet underlines from the outset, um, pretty mixed up, pretty messed up. We, we can bring a whole load of baggage with us, a whole load of kind of complicated things. We're, we're all sorts of oddities in our personality that make us sometimes really difficult people to get on with. Uh, sometimes we have the most bizarre sense of humor that doesn't sound like a sense of humor at all to most of us, but, but it's there. We're just odd bods, and, and yet and God reveals his glory through that, and chapter 3 says, yeah, that's what he's doing. And he's demonstrated just how able he is to take all these crazy little bits of, of complicated, tiny bits of jigsaw, put them all together in a way that, that presents a portrait of himself to the world that is quite astonishing. Uh, that's what chapter 3 is essentially on about. Um, its theme, basically, is simply this, God loves to make himself known. So you take nothing else away from what we're learning from uh, Ephesians 3 this morning. It's this, God wants you to know him. He's not hiding from you as though, you know, he doesn't really want you to see what he's like and, and meet with him. He wants to make himself known. He wants you to know him. What's he like? Good question. He says, let me try and show you what I am like. And that's the, the, the underlying theme of this whole chapter. The way it breaks up is like this. Starts at verse 2. Uh, because verse 1, he, he kind of starts off praying, and then he thinks, no, you know, before I get to praying, uh, I need to explain uh, what I'm about. So uh, verses 2 to 13 of the chapter uh, are simply this, God reveals himself to his people. And um, verses 2 to 6 explain uh, the fact that he does, and then verses 7 to 13 explain the way that he does it. But Basically, that's what verses 2 to 13 are underlining. God reveals himself to his people. Uh, Paul wants us to be clear about that before he even starts praying uh, along those lines. And so he writes as he does in the verses that uh, Richard started reading for us. Um, and so I only asked him to read verses 2 to 6, not like he kind of got fed up halfway through and stopped at verse 6. Um, I just asked him, verses 2 to 6, let's read that as a starting point. So we have read that. They, they basically are underlining the fact that he does so. And you'll see if you look closely at these verses that uh, one word occurs pretty regularly, and that's the word mystery. And you might be beginning to feel, well, yeah, this is this kind of good ground because the whole thing is just mysterious to me. I haven't a clue what it's on about. Um, the word mystery that occurs a number of times, three times in the, the course of those verses there and a fourth time later on, that, that word used in the Bible means essentially not something that is kind of so odd, so weird that um, it just doesn't make any sort of sense at all, but rather it is a truth, it is a reality that requires to be revealed to us rather than something we can just kind of figure out by ourselves because we you know, apply our minds to it and then we figure it out and, and get it. You will never get it. It needs to be revealed to you. And uh, that's essentially what these verses are spelling out, that God reveals to us an astonishing truth. 
Um, so why is it a mystery? First of all, verses two to three, uh, because it requires God to reveal it to us. You'll see that that's essentially what Paul is saying there. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. I didn't figure this one out, says Paul, right? Now, Paul was a pretty smart guy. I mean, his IQ would probably be way higher than yours. In fact, probably higher than all of us put together. I mean, he, he just had a massive intellect. But he's saying, I, this was not something I kind of figured out by myself because I'm clever. This was revealed to me. Um, and it required to be revealed to me by the Lord for you, as I've already written, written briefly, he said. Um, verses 4 to 5 uh, explain a little bit how this mystery is made known to us, how it is revealed by God. And uh, cutting a few corners here, we can put it like this. Uh, first of all, it is progressive. Um, it is just bit by bit. God increasingly uh, reveals his truth. That's uh, the reason why uh, in the Old Testament, uh, gradually the picture begins to become clearer until we come finally to the New Testament. Then it becomes even clearer still. Um, that's the way God works. It is progressive. Chapter one of the Bible um, underlines that. Uh, in creation, God doesn't do it all in a wonder. It is bit by bit, day by day. And he, he does a bit, stands back, looks, says, yep, that's good. Let's build on that. Uh, and that's how he goes about revealing himself as well. It is progressive. Um, second thing that's made clear in these verses four and five is that it is through his spirit. Uh, God works by his spirit to open our eyes, to give to us understanding. That's, that's a gift that he gives, that grace, the administration of God's grace whereby our eyes are open. We begin to get it. We begin to see it. That's the work of God's Holy Spirit. And the way that the Holy Spirit works, you'll see in these verses, is through prophets and apostles, uh, those uh, through whom the Spirit of God teaches uh, that truth. Uh, verses 4 and 5. Verse 6 then goes on to explain what that mystery is. And uh, this great truth, this great reality um, that requires to be revealed is, is, is so massive that, that we would never have figured it out. And it is essentially this, that Jews and Gentiles are brought together by God to be one body together. I mean, that, that is so crazy in the ancient world uh, as to have been utterly unbelievable. They would have laughed you out of court if you had, you had suggested that that's what, what God was about. I mean, no one in their right mind even countenance doing that. Jews and Gentiles hated one another so much with such a long, long, deep history of hatred and animosity towards one another. There was no way that you would get them together. They are so, so different. And God says, yeah, well, you want to see what I can do. Um, that's what he's about. Jew and Gentile together, the Gentiles uh, along with the Jews, together with Jews, uh, are members together of one body, sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. They all get to know life, Jew and Gentile, no matter your background. And uh, that's the, uh, the, the glory of it. Um, the astonishing diversity that there is in terms of background and culture and uh, nationhood and language and personality and experience. Uh, God brings them all together, a million and more different bits of that, that jigsaw and puts them all together in a way that not only means the bits stick together and hold together, but in that way are able to show forth his greatness. Um, so he's, he's underlining verses 2 to 6, uh, the fact that God likes to make himself known. And then verses 7 to 13, he goes on to explain the way that he does so. And again, I've put this just under three brief headings for you. Uh, first of all, in terms of our calling, uh, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Uh, although I'm least, less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Uh, 
what he's pointed to is um, that this, this is the, the task that was given to him. Uh, his task was to proclaim the unsearchable, boundless uh, riches of Jesus Christ, that life that is found in him. Uh, who he is, what he's done, why he matters, that's his job, to proclaim the greatness and the, the riches of Jesus Christ. And, and what Paul, as an apostle, is saying, that's, that's my calling, um, is, is picked up by the apostle Peter later in his first letter to say, basically, that, that's our calling as well. Our calling is, as a royal nation, to declare the praises of our great God, the wonderful deeds that this God has done. That's our calling. Um, uh, seven to nine, it is to proclaim and declare the, uh, the uh, wonderful glory of God, the praises of our God. Um, verses um, uh, 10 and 11, he goes on to underline that our living together is indeed to display God's glory. This is how God reveals himself to the world. It's our calling, first of all, to, to declare the praise of God, and then see how he goes on. Verse 10, God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what God is doing in and through Jesus is, is declaring and revealing to the, the watching universe how wise and how good and how right and how mighty and how kind God is to display the full glory of this wise, wise God who dreams up the most astonishing plans and has the capacity to figure out how on earth you bring those plans to fulfillment. He knows what he's doing. And he wants the world to see that he knows what he's doing, that manifold wisdom of God. His intent was that that should now be revealed through his church. Um, you you want to see what it's like, how wise God is, and how he's able to do what seems to you impossible to do, then you watch the church. That's where he does it. Our life together is the platform through which God displays his glory. So you want to be living a life that displays the glory of God, then you, you don't have an option in terms of the way that the scripture speaks you need to be involved in, you need to be a part of, you need to be rooted in a fellowship of his people. And then thirdly, you see he goes on in uh, uh, that final verse 12 and 13 uh, to underline that our suffering is to secure God's glory. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Paul in prison, so freedom is uh, an interesting word that he uses. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. In other words, he's saying, um, so get, a, get a, a, a right perspective on your circumstances. I'm in prison. He says, yeah, I, I don't enjoy being in prison. I don't like being in prison. I'm not a masochist like that. Uh, oh, things are tough from that point of view. But the flip side of that is that um, uh, that's the means that God is using in order to bring his people together, bring believers together, form churches, plant churches in one place after another. And if, and if that's what it takes, is I'm up for it. You know, I'm, I'm happy to bear with that suffering. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. But if, if that's what God is doing through it, I'm in. Count me in. I'm, I'm part of this. And that's a perspective thing. Um, that's the, the, uh, the first part of the, the chapter. Um, we'll be briefer in the second part. Verses um, 14 to uh, 21. Uh, see then Paul praying. He kind of started praying at verse 1 of the chapter. You'll see, for this reason, he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And then verse 14, he pitches, and again, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, uh, from whom um, the NIV translated every family, but actually it should be the whole family. He's talking about the family of God's people. Uh, it's from him that we derive our name, our character, our, our, our whole life. Um, I kneel before the Father from whom the whole family in heaven on earth derives its name. And then the prayer goes on. So he starts off really uh, with uh, the reason why he prays as he does. And for that, 
Um, you really have to go back to the end of chapter 2 because uh, verse 1 of chapter 3, for this reason I'm praying, um, is on the back of the end of chapter 2. And uh, the essence of what he's saying is um, that, that God, look at the end of chapter 2 if you've got a Bible there, uh, God has been pleased to come and make his dwelling in his church and among his people as they, they meet together, serve together, worship together, live together as a fellowship. That's where God chooses to make his presence known, to come and dwell by his spirit. Well, wow, says Paul. Um, in other words, um, God can be known among his people. That, that's, that's what God is about. So he says, I, I'm going to pray for you. If that's what God is about, I need to pray for you. And, and he prays um, essentially two things. And uh, we'll read the passage, and then I'll explain what those two things are. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and earth derives its name, and I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Um, that's the first part of his prayer. Um, and you, you'll notice there that he may strengthen you with power. Hold on to those two words because they, they occur in the second part of his praying as well. Uh, he's saying, if, if God is going to dwell among you and make himself known through, you're going to need to be strengthened. And the first reason is he's, he's going to have to strengthen you, uh, plural, in order that you in your life may be able to accommodate the greatness of, and the vibrancy of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Because naturally, your heart isn't big enough. Your heart isn't strong enough to cope with his presence dwelling in you. I mean, it's just going to burst. So God is going to have to strengthen our hearts for us from within our hearts to know the reality of Christ dwelling within us. Uh, I used to work in farms um, when I was uh, a teenager. That was uh, what I, I loved doing and what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I, I just loved being on farms. And on this particular farm up in the north of Scotland in uh, Easter Ross, uh, the farmer, uh, who was a very wealthy guy, had a big, big barn that previously had been used for kind of housing tractors and all sorts of farm equipment. And he wanted to empty all the equipment out and in its place, he was just going to package in grain from all over the, the, the county. And, and he realized to do that, he would need to strengthen the walls of the barn because they were just a, kind of a single uh, run of breeze blocks the whole way around. And he knew that if he puts grain in there, the grain is so hell, hell, heavy, it's just going to push these walls, it's just going to burst the walls out. And so one of the jobs that I had was this huge big barn. Um, we had day by day, we had uh, on the front of a tractor, we, we clamped on a massive thick metal uh, iron board that was clamped onto the stanchions. You know, you visualize these two stanchions. We'd clamp it on so that on the one hand, you've got the breeze block uh, wall behind it. And the other side, you've got this, this metal, this huge thick metal block that is clamped on and then we would uh, we would get uh, concrete uh, on the the front of the tractor lift it up and, uh, and shovel it in from the top way up there from about the height of the, the the balcony there we would shovel it down into the gap there uh, so that it was just a thick uh, eight inch uh, layer of concrete the whole way up that was put there and and every morning I would get onto the the front of the the front loader of the tractor with the uh, the the concrete there and it'd be raised up me in the concrete and shoveling from about uh, 10 feet up shoveling concrete down into this gap um, the whole way up the barn um, and the reason to strengthen the walls so that the the barn was then able to to accommodate all the grain and the weight of the grain. And it's that sort of picture that Paul is on about, yeah, you're going to be strengthened. You've got, you've got Jesus dwelling among you? Um, get real, he's saying. You know, he is big. He is mighty. The weight of his glory is massive. You're going to need to be strengthened. So I'm praying that God, by his Spirit, would indeed mightily strengthen you so that the, the walls of your heart are able to cope with Jesus himself dwelling among us. And praise God, that's what he does. He equips us to live out a life where Jesus himself present among us. That's his first prayer. First part of his prayer. Second part. 
verse 17b. And he says, in case you think I've finished, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love, and he means in that love, in other words, having Jesus among you, having the one who loves you, having the one whose love for you has stretched right back to eternity and stretches all the way into eternity as well, that massive Jesus dwelling among you, being rooted his word, not mine, and established in love, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you being rooted and established in love may have power, again, together with all the Lord's holy people. Note that. You don't get it on your own. It's not an individual personal experience. It is in the company of God's people, uh, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of of God. Now, there's masses here, but we don't have time for it. What he's praying is that um, God, in his grace, would not only strengthen your hearts by his Holy Spirit so you're able to cope with and handle and accommodate Jesus, but that in your life together, you may be able, one, to grasp intellectually how immense the love of Jesus is. That's the first thing, to grasp intellectually uh, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Uh, to know, secondly, the wonder of that love experientially, so that it's not just a kind of intellectual thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's amazing just how, how much the Lord has loved us, not just in our heads, but in our hearts, so that you may know that experientially, that you may know that you are loved like that, by Almighty God, that transforms your whole living, radiates the Lord Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, that you might show the beauty of that love relationally, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In other words, in your life, uh, rooted in Christ's love for you, that you, you've grasped intellectually, you are experiencing uh, in your hearts like that, that in the way that you then relate to one another, the fullness of God and his glory may indeed be made known among you. That's what he's praying. He's basically praying that, that God would so come by his spirit and dwell in the hearts of his people like that and be present among them in such a way that in their love for one another that reflects the love of Jesus for them, they may radiate the glory of Jesus himself. And he anticipates that people say, you know, come on, Paul. I mean, you don't looked around the church. You don't see what, uh, what a, a load of different people they are. You don't see how odd they are, how awkward they are, how difficult they are. You really think that's possible? He says, yeah, I, I do. And he goes on then to say, uh, and explain his confidence. How is that going to happen? It's not going to happen because you and I think that's a pretty good idea. It's a pretty smart idea. Let's, let's learn to live like that. And let's learn to love one another. Not going to happen that way, he says. It's going to happen because this God is able to do immeasurably more than all that you ask or even don't dare ask because it's kind of too crazy to ask, even think he's able to do even more than that. That's how, how able he is, how strong he is, how mighty he is uh, through his power at work in you by his spirit. That's what he does. That's who he is. That's how bold how confident he is, the living God, in his own ability to do that. But that's what he's intent on doing. His intent was and is that now through his church, that's his means, uh, and he's not changed his means, he's not changed his, uh, his approach and kind of given up the church and thought, you know, we should adopt some sort of modern technology, maybe use uh, kind of social media, that's going to be a better way of going. About. Not at all. Now, through his church, the manifold wisdom of God, the way that he does all things well, should be made known. And uh, that's what he's doing among us here. And, and that's why we, we exhort you, say, yeah, put your roots down. Get involved. Be committed. Put those roots down. Be a part of that. Don't make miss out on that. Don't, don't be kind of uh, uh, just loosely connected, as it were, because you, you're liable to get blown away by, by the wind if you're just uh, lying there on the patio as a pot plant. Put down roots so that you're, you're part of uh, this fellowship of God's people, because that's what he's doing. 
um, by the power of his spirit and for the praise of his own glory. Now, says Paul, as he rounds it off, and I'm rounding off as well, so don't worry. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And, and that, remember, is the context in which he's saying this. It's, it's what he's just prayed. To him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. And you know what that means. It means the end of the sermon. Amen. And you say, hallelujah, amen, indeed. That's what you're part of, and, and that's what he means you to be a part of. And he's able to do that, and uh, come and, and see and be a part of that, and, and you'll be among those who at the very end are, are proclaiming, Lord, how wonderful you are. What mighty things you do. What a, what a privilege, what a blessing it has been to be a part of your church. Uh, thank you, Lord. Amen. May God add his blessing to his word. Father, thank you that you... You uh, purpose such immense, glorious things, and that you have the audacity, the sheer audacity to figure that you can take a bunch of no-hopers, of mixed up people from all sorts of different backgrounds who would never in a million years be able to get together, function together, and you have the audacity to to, uh, to reckon that you're able to bring them together, uh, effect that change in them, uh, place them together, bind them together in such a way that in their common life together, they show forth your glory. What a privilege that is, Lord. We, we want to be a part of that. And we're glad, therefore, to offer ourselves to that end again as we close off our worship this day. For your own name's sake, amen. Well, as our closing praise, then let's join to sing the hymn, Glory Be to God the Father. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. <laughs>